Hi, I'm Stanley Goldberg, host of the Inquiring Mind podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you're new here, I release two episodes a week with a variety of fascinating guests. And I would appreciate if you would support my podcast by liking this video and subscribing down below. Thank you for your support. And now to today's guest. Jonathan Wilson, welcome to the Inquiring Mind podcast. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. I'm a huge fan of your books. I almost uh, can't believe that, you know, I get to speak to about a topic I, I, I love and I played soccer my whole life, well, football. Um, and I get to talk to a person that has written books that have shaped or reshaped my thinking about the game. Uh, one of my personal favorites, I'm sure a lot of people know, Inverting the Pyramid. Uh, I've probably gifted this book so many times to people that love the game. And um, yeah, it's an incredible book. There's also, you've written 11 books, but some of the ones I have are the, the Barcelona Inheritance and the names heard long ago. Uh, so before we get started, can you tell the audience how you first decided to, that you wanted to write about soccer and uh, it was a complete accident, really. Uh, I mean, it, it's one of those things where you look back from now and it, it kind of, it seems obvious. You know, I loved football, knew a lot about football. Uh, went to my first match when I was five years old with my dad. Um, basically, all life when I was growing up was based around football. Uh, that, you know, at a quarter to five on a Saturday afternoon, we had to be by radio or the TV to find out the scores. Um, as soon as I was old enough to go, my dad started taking me. My gran lived very near uh, Roker Park, Sunderland Stadium, so that uh, even if I didn't go to the game, I was if I was visiting her, you could you could hear what was happening from the game because you know, it was it was close enough you could hear the crowd. Um, and and so yeah, it, it was is what you structured the 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 week around. Um, but I I sort of I mean stupidly I was completely wrong. I, I thought I'd be an academic. Um, uh, and uh, I, I did did my BA, did my master's, um, was accepted to do a, a doctorate, which would have been on constructions of imperial masculinity in Conrad and Kipling. Got accepted um, with yeah the, the, the guy I absolutely wanted to do it with, and then I couldn't get funding, and that sort of made me yeah you know, really um, consider how serious I was about doing that. And it, you know, it's very normal in, in the UK. You don't get funding in the first year that, that you know, they, they make you sort of do a year to prove you're serious. But I, I kind of thought, you know, do I really want to be an academic? Is, that, is this really how I see the rest of my life? Because it's very easy to sort of stay on that. You know, I enjoyed being a student. I enjoyed reading books and writing essays. It, it, it's, it's the easy thing is to sort of just keep going with that. Uh, and I thought, actually, no, I, financially, I can't, can't do this. I, I don't care enough about that to... Uh, yeah, to live in poverty and, and, and have very little prospect of making much money in the future. Um, so I started doing temping work in, in factories and offices. Um, I was based up in Sunderland at the time, uh, still living with my parents uh, once I finished doing the master's. Uh, and then some mates of mine uh, had a spare room in uh, their new house in London, said, do you want to move down? So I thought, well, it's got to be it's got to be more fun than living with my parents for the rest of my life. So uh, went down to London, started doing some temping there, did a journalism course, which was kind of pointless to be honest, and then was very lucky. I, I stumbled into uh, a website in April two thousand, and that was my start. Uh, I mean, I'd been writing for the Sunderland fanzine. I'd, I'd done um, student journalism at university. I'd started freelancing even before I did the journalism course. Um, and then, yeah, it's just sort of continued from, from there. So, yeah, a happy accident. But, you know, to be honest, a lucky escape to get out of academia. I would not have, I would not have enjoyed that. Uh, you, you mentioned the fact that you grew up around Sunderland. Did you, did you watch the Netflix show, Sunderland Till I Die? Or... Yeah, which is, is actually the, the lads who made it were three years below me at school. Mm. So I, did, I didn't really... I mean, I'm not kind of great mates of them or anything, but um, I, don't, I don't really remember them from school, but I've also met them a few times since. And I think the great thing about that show is that um, 
they approach it with a lot of love. Yeah, they 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 understand the the, the club, they understand the city, uh, they understand the fans, and I think you get a real sense of of, of what the club means to the area. Um, and they're very good at finding the bit of Sunderland that look attractive. Um, yeah, there's some really sort of beautiful shots of the cliffs and things, which certainly in the UK maybe isn't the image Sutherland has in the popular imagination. So yeah, I, I really enjoyed it, and uh, I, yeah, I thought it, yeah they did a great job of sort of. Uh, you know, e- explaining why football is is so central to to life in Sunderland. Yeah, and and many people in the United States might not know the effect uh, the game has on um, small towns. Can you can you kind of explain maybe the maybe the pros and cons of having a major football club at in your town that people well, might not know otherwise? I think. Um, I mean, you say small town, and I guess by by US standards, Sunderland is a, is, is a small city, not not a town. It became a city in 1992 officially, um, but it, it didn't used to be. You know, it used to be important. Uh, so Sunderland was one of the great shipbuilding ports of the world. Um, you know, various years in the 1870s when it produced a greater tonnage of ship than, than anywhere else in the world. Um, in fact, Sunderland was so seen as so uh, important to the, to the British Navy, which obviously is where Britain's power came from. That was one of only two uh, British towns um, that were shelled during the US War of Independence. Um, there was a privateer sort of started shelling the shipyards there in Whitehaven on the other coast. For the same reason they was to try, you know, try and stop the ships. Um, and and that, that sort of legacy lingers that, you know, you, You've got to look pretty hard these days, but if if you if you can sort of imagine bits of the centre and you take away all the crappy plastic and stuff, and you can see these grand old buildings when Sunderland was a was a rich place, um, and you're even even in the thirties, Sunderland produced a greater tonnage of ship than the, the entire east coast of the US, uh, so it was vital in in the, in the Second World War. Uh, plus, it had had uh, coal mining. Um, I want you. One of the reasons for the rivalry with Newcastle is is who had the right to export coal from the northeast coal field, which in the you know in the civil in the English Civil War, um, Sunderland backed the uh, the parliamentarians against the royalists, and so that brief period when we didn't have a king, we got the right to export coal, and then that was taken off us as soon as the the king came back. Um, so yeah, Sunderland is this sort of city that's in this sort of slow spiral of decline it's very hard to reverse because the industry's gone you know you can just make ships a lot more cheaply in in russia japan bangladesh um the river's not quite big enough for modern ships um and so i I, yes certainly all my life and i think probably the sort of 10 or 20 years before that there was a sense of of sudden looking for a role looking for uh you know what's that what's the point of us these days and you you look back at even in the 50s pictures of fans crossing the bridge to go to the stadium um and you see the by the riverbanks which now are just sort of bushes and and you know sort of overgrown uh the the shipyards there's this industry everywhere smoke billowing from everywhere and i think to lose that to lose something um yeah it's, i mean it's a sort of classic story of post-industrial decline so what what does someone have what's someone's place in the world um well it's football now and so this, what brings this home is uh, I was in I was in Ethiopia in 2015, and I was going to see the grave of Emmeline Pankhurst, the suffragette. Uh, she became yeah, very involved in in uh, the struggle for Abyssinian rights in the 1930s, and so she's buried in Addis Ababa. And quite near the grave, there's a huge anchor, and the anchor has written on it, "Made in Sunderland." And this is in Addis Ababa, not even near the coast, but in Ethiopia, people knew Sunderland because of the ships. And I, I think there was a great, although obviously working in the shipyards was, yeah, for the, for the actual workers, badly paid, very difficult job, very dangerous job in many ways, and, and mining even, even worse. There was a sort of pride in that. So where do we get our pride now? Well, it, it comes through the football. But of course, the football club's also gone into decline because there's no money. So there's Sunderland in the 1890s is one of the two biggest sides in England and therefore the world, along with Aston Villa. Uh, Sunderland won six league titles before the Second World War uh, and was one of the half dozen biggest clubs in the country. 
Uh, but then, you know, the, the, the money runs out and the decline begins. And since the Second World War, we've won one trophy. Yeah, and I, I think, again, from an American point of view, there's nothing the, – the reason uh, football appeals to so many Americans now – is because no sport, in my opinion, feel free, people can feel free to disagree, in the world can make, has a fan base in smaller towns or big towns quite like football does in Europe, all over Europe, where you have, especially in England, where you have, uh, you know, clubs like Sunderland, Newcastle, and you see Liverpool, Manchester United, you know, all of these clubs, they have these passionate fans and here in the states nobody talks about the new york knicks quite the way I'm, a, I'm from new york and nobody talks about the new york knicks quite the way they talk about uh i'm a liverpool fan too and nobody nobody talks about it like they do about liverpool um and i think there's just so much passion and love and, and joy you could see that the game brings and it, how important it is to people's way of life that is almost not comparable to any any other sport yeah i mean it's the difference between a, a franchise model and a, an organic model and and it's pros and cons to both but in terms of representing the the, the city or the town or the village or, or whatever it happens to be um the organic model clearly has advantages and i think you know david goldblatt's most recent book uh the age of football it makes a point and i think he's right Football is the most, not just in, ter in sporting terms, but is the most universal, football now is the most universal cultural mode that has ever been. But you go pretty much anywhere in the world and you can use football to start a conversation. Um, and so the, you know, the thing that, was so two things fairly recently have brought that home to me. So when I was in Ethiopia, I went to these sort of big video halls where they, they watch Premier League games. Um, I was in Lalabella, which you know, is famous as Rock Church. It's really quite a small village. Um, and uh, so I realized it was 20% of the adult male population of, the, of this you know, small town, I guess, large village, were watching Premier League football every Saturday afternoon. And so there was a, one of the games that I watched was uh, Swansea against Arsenal. And uh, Gilfie Sigurdsson was playing for Swansea. And it occurred to me that Gilfie Sigurdsson is by some margin the most famous man from Iceland in history. And it's not even close. Because you know, a, a large part of the population of Ethiopia knows who Gilfie Sigurdsson is, let alone Iceland or the UK or, or the US or wherever. And, and that, that, I think, is an extraordinary thing. And then uh, you know, recently when uh, Papa Bujop died, the Senegalese midfielder who scored against France in the 2002 World Cup, you know, similar realization. I sort of thought, yeah, he's the most that, that, when he scored against France, that is the most famous moment in Senegalese history. Now, that's not to deny that Senegal has had great poets and politicians and musicians and, and whatever, but in terms of a moment that that the the greatest proportion of the world knows about, it's that goal against France in two thousand and two. That if you go to the average person in the street, what you know, anywhere in the world, and say. Senegal, what do you think of? That is going to be the most common answer. Them beating France in that first game in 2002. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting uh, observation. Uh, do, you think, do you think that we currently live in the greatest era of football? Or is that a too big of a statement to make? Um, it depends what you mean by great. Uh, so... In terms of a level of football played by the top clubs, yes, definitely. In terms of global popularity, yes, definitely. In terms of... Um, is it organised in the best way it could be? Well, no, it's clearly not. Um, you know, the, the, the super club era, and which I now think we're moving out of towards a Petra club era, I think that's deeply unhealthy uh, for, the, for the game, not just now, but in, in the future. Um, so I don't know what the tendency is always to look back to some sort of golden age, and golden age is by their nature a, a mythic. So, and I, I'm very aware of the tendency, I guess, not just for football fans, but certainly with football fans, that you think the thing you, know, you think football as it was when you were sort of between the ages of about five and 15, 
was, yeah, that was the golden age when I first understood it. And obviously, you look back to football in the 80s and it was horrendous in many ways in terms of you know, fan violence, the, the, the stadiums, the quality of football. So you, know, you can't really say the 80s were better than now. But there were elements of the 80s that we could learn from now in terms of a, you know, um, a, a structure that doesn't create mass inequality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, I think you just brought up the idea of the European the, the super teams and, and whatnot. Uh, I think the scandal of the European Super League, which happened a few months back, kind of has dissipated with the start of the Premier League season with all the leagues starting. But do you think that there has been a, uh, or will be long-lasting effects of the Super League on the future? Well, I think the Super League, um, I think it's a symptom. I don't think, I don't think, we, I don't think that's the, the cause. Um, the Super League is a symptom of a group of wealthy, successful establishment clubs who are used to running things and used to having things their own way. And yeah, by that, I, I mean Real Madrid, Barcelona, Juventus, um, Manchester United, Liverpool, Arsenal, um, and, yeah, and, and, and the rest, uh, Bayern to an extent. Um, and they are very threatened by the rise of clubs like Chelsea, Manchester City, PSG, who have this external wealth. You know, they, they, they are not dependent on success on the pitch. And, and for, for clubs that are used to having to, at least an extent, perform on the pitch to, to, to maintain their income, that's a very, you know, very worrying thing. And COVID and, and the, the fact that fans haven't been, weren't in stadiums for, for a year um, sort of heightened those concerns and made those, you know, we've seen with Barcelona, 1.3 billion euros in debt, having to let Messi leave. Uh, you've seen even with Real Madrid, you know, having to really cut back on their usual spending for all they apparently tried to sign Mbappe if they really did. Um, and, and so the, the, the idea of the Super League was to get them guaranteed income and so to get rid of the advantage that City and PSG and Chelsea have. And I, slightly, I say Chelsea slightly reluctantly there because they, Abramovich's wealth is clearly not the same as the wealth of Abu Dhabi or, or Qatar while still being in excess of, uh, of uh, clubs who are funded in a more traditional manner. Yeah, I, I, I recently listened to an interview with Arsene Wenger where he explained the the financial problems facing football today. And he, he caught a lot of flack uh, during his time as manager when he refused, didn't want to buy certain players. And, and in the interview, he kind of justifies it by the fact that, you know, in the early 2000s, they had the most advanced training facility in the world. And he goes, we had to pay it off. And then they built a new stadium. We have to pay it off. And he goes, one of my proudest accomplishments was leaving Arsenal having no debt or paid off the debt that uh, essentially uh, happened under my time there. And this brings up a lot of questions because you see these astronomical salaries for, for footballers everywhere. And Barcelona is dealing with this now, right, where they, they paid Coutinho, for example, what is it, $350,000 a week to, to sit on the bench, essentially. More, more than that, I, I yeah. think. I'm not, yeah. you know, I don't have a thing in front of me, but I, I, would just, I would have thought it was more than that. Right, and it just seems like there has to be a cap. Not that I want to impose a cap, but there has to be a cap someplace, right? It, it just can't um, keep no, going no, up. No, I, 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 I disagree. I, I um. And the reason I, I, I disagree for two reasons. The one is I think it's totally impractical because how do you impose a global cap and enforce it? I just don't think you can. Um, so you know, I, I, just, I think a cap is unworkable. And the, the other reason I oppose it is it's, it's, a, it's not addressing the cause. And the cause of the problem is that we have a, a, a structure that makes the rich richer and you know, so the, the, you know, the rich pull away from the rest more and more. In England until 1981, every single league game, the away team took 25% of the gate revenues. So that is the, the rich clubs subsidising the poorer clubs. 
And in order for them to have proper competition, that is what you have to do. And obviously giving 25% still means the big clubs have an advantage. The clubs with the biggest stadiums have an advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what's happened after that is TV broadcast rights have gone through the roof, which, you know, in, in the 1970s was just not an issue. It was, it was, a, it was a pittance. Uh, and broadcast rights now are worth far more than, than gate receipts. Um, and where the Premier League got it very right was to have a relatively equitable distribution of those rights. So there's collective bargaining and uh, I, you know, the, the team who finishes top of the league gets roughly double what the team who finishes bottom of the league gets. You look at Spain, and I think it's a factor of 17. So what, what that means is in La Liga, you get half the teams they're just not playing the same sport. They can't compete. And that makes, for, in my opinion, incredibly bad football. Unless you really want to see celebrity players doing tricks against you know, glorified traffic cones. It's, it's, it's just not a contest. So you have to work out a way where the, the rich subsidise the poor. Now, the problem is, if you, you know, even in England, where I think we, we have broadly got it better than the rest of the world, you still have a huge gulf because there's a massive drop off below the Premier League to the Championship. So you have to work out a way of subsidising the bottom of the game. And that's clearly incredibly difficult to do and incredibly difficult to get right on a continental or a global basis. But until you do that, you're always going to have these inequalities. And then you, you have these external forces of your states coming in to buy clubs or, or oligarchs um, who have that external wealth. Now, to an extent, we've always had that. We've always had rich businessmen would buy a club or take over a club and invest a huge amount of money. So we saw it happen to Blackburn in, in the 90s. But what was different then was it, it was one man or one company and that, that would last for sort of 10 years, maybe. But eventually it becomes unsustainable. If you don't have a crowd base, you can't sustain that. So you know this is sort of a temporary blip. And Blackburn knew in the 90s, this is our golden period. This is our opportunity. And as soon as Jack Walker dies or you know, the business passes on, that funding is going to be cut off, which can have desperate consequences for clubs. Um, but if you have a state... We, we don't know what, what, what the plans of Qatar or Abu Dhabi are. I mean, I, I think it'd be really interesting what happens after the World Cup in Qatar. Do they still care about football in the same way? If, they continue, if we continue to have scrutiny of uh, human rights in Qatar and Abu Dhabi, as we have now, at what point do the states think, actually, this, the, the benefits we thought we were getting from this sort of soft power initiative are outweighed by the criticism we're getting? So could the plug be pulled there? You'll be seen with... Um, Chinese investment in yeah. football, how the government, a government can, can very quickly change course and suddenly you have Inter in huge financial trouble because uh, the, the, the Chinese company who owns them is told you, you've got to cut your debts, you cannot have these debts. And you know, they had to, uh, Jiangsu, the, 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 the Chinese club that they also owned, they had to wind up. So... I don't think there's any, anything to say that Abu Dhabi and Qatar are in this in perpetuity. And I think you probably have to accept that occasionally you will get external forces come in. But the, the bigger problem is the structure of football at the moment, really since the Champions League came in, uh, in you know, early 90s, 92, and the way we distribute broadcast rights makes the rich much richer and the poor much poorer. And that creates a very unlevel playing field, which is deeply unsatisfying for everybody. Is there a way to uh, spread the revenue more equally or fairly or would that be unattainable with it it's incredibly difficult but i, I think yeah. a, a way you could do it is to say um there's a you know whatever it's champions league say right the here's the prize pot it's you know x million euros and we'll give that of that 20 percent will go to the clubs who are actually competing the other 80 percent will go to the federations and they can determine how, how that's distributed among their clubs. So that, that, that would be a beginning of, of, of a reset. But you're almost at the point now thinking we need a complete financial meltdown in football to, to, to allow a reset to happen. Um, I mean, you look at the... I think history will look back on the signing of Neymar by PSG as an absolutely critical moment in, in the development of, of, uh, of the modern game. Because that fee of 220 million euros was more than double the previous transfer record. And we've never seen it go up in a, in a in that sort of increment. 
not you know since the 1890s when to be honest i don't trust the figures at all so in, in when we know what the transfer fees are this is totally unprecedented that the world transfer record should more than double in one step but what they did by doing that and whether they did this on purpose or not i've, I've no idea but what that you know, to an extent, that was a, 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 a statement signing of, look at us, we can get anybody we want. But also, it inflated the market. The Barcelona then were, we've got all this money, and we need a star because we just lost one of our biggest stars. And they go out and they waste it on Dembele and on Coutinho. And they're still paying the price for that. But those two signings also inflate the market. And the, the only clubs who can actually afford to compete in that market are PSG and Manchester City. Manchester City have actually been given the wealth they have, relatively conservative in their spending. You know, it's only this summer with signing Jack Grealish that they've gone above sort of, I don't know, £65 million, £70 million, whatever De Bruyne was, which for a club of their, 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 their stature was a relatively low record transfer. Um, and, and of course, the, the, the sort of final marker of PSG's victory is not only do they get Neymar because of that transfer, but ultimately they get Messi as well, but they get him for free because Barcelona messed it up so badly so yeah that, that inflation of the market in 2017 I, I, I think has had you know and obviously COVID has exacerbated but it had devastating consequences yeah how about for for a club like Barcelona where you you know you've obviously just lost Pjanic uh, I mean the big one is obviously Messi that's unquestionable uh, Pjanic Messi Griezmann went on loan Emerson who they bought like 30 days ago is gone um do you think that this is the new leadership just ripping the bandaid and saying we have to fix these problems now and we'll face the criticism or it's just dysfunctional? That's that's all it is. Um, well, I, we'll find out is the kind of the, the cowardly answer to that. Um, I mean, the problems are not of this presidency. They, you know, they, they, they're from a previous presidency, which actually, you know, it's... Um, it's an interesting, you know, the, the tendency for a long time in certainly in the UK was to, to look at Barcelona and Real Madrid and think, actually, they're the model. You, you know, president, presidential elections every four years, and then you have fan, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the board is much more answerable to fans. But the problem is that presidents make stupid populist decisions to get elected again. And uh, that's not necessarily the best thing for the development of a club or, or for the club's finances. So the one thing this, this regime has uh, still got badly wrong is not to renew Messi's contract when they could have done. By letting it run out and trying to re-register him, that's what forced him to leave. They, you know, they could have just extended his contract on poorer terms in May and it would have been fine. And they didn't do that. So that's an act of incredible stupidity. But obviously the financial issues... Uh, the previous regime and I sort of think Barcelona are now in a position where the only thing they really can do is rely on La Masia and hope the players coming through are, are good enough and they do seem to have two or three very good young players um, and Koeman is, is very good at working with, with young players so I, 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 I think from their point of view they've got to cut that debt and actually given the traditions of the club given Koeman's personality and his track record, uh, I think they, they can sort of achieve a, a minor PR victory by saying, we're going back to our roots, we're basing it on players we've produced, we're going back to the old philosophy. And I think fans largely, yeah, any, any who have any understanding of the finances would, would, would accept that. Mm -hmm. And do you think that's, a, that's a, a viable model in today's game where you have, you know, an academy, academy products coming through? Uh, the system and, and then going into the first team? Um, I think, well, you'd hope it is. Uh, I mean, I think you always need to supplement it. And I think one of the things Guardiola did really well in his time in Barcelona was, was to promote, I mean, Busquets and Pedro particularly, but I think that team that won the 2009, the team that started the, the, the 2009 Champions League final, I think there were seven academy graduates. Mm -hmm. So it can be done to have two thirds of your team being academy graduates. You're obviously there's an element of luck there as to whether you have a good generation coming through and you see a club like Ajax, it goes in waves. You have a good generation, you have a weaker generation, you have a good generation, you have a weaker generation. But if you're doing the right things at academy level, then you, know, you should be able to maximise the talent that's there. And I guess if you're Barcelona, you say, well, two or three years, we, um, 
we accept the situation as it is, and we very much restrict our spending. And we'll we'll see, you know, if we can get the debt down to half a billion euros, which is I mean, get it down, get down, get get the debt down to that, and and then maybe they can supplement that squad with with a couple of, of, of biggish signings to, to to fill the gaps. Um, but I don't I don't really see what what other option they have, and I think what's also telling you, know, or the question they have to ask is what is their aim? What are they trying to do? I mean, they clearly shouldn't be trying to win the Champions League now, but, yeah, because they can't they won't they won't do that. But have a decent run in the Champions League, get whatever revenues they can from that. And actually, La Liga, there's no reason why they can't win it. Uh, you know, if you look at the, the, the betting markets, Sevilla, the fourth favourites at the beginning of the season, was 16 to 1. So, you know, the, the bookmakers still think Barcelona were one of the, you know, by, I think they were still second favourites, I think they were still ahead of Atletico. Uh, so, I mean, that was before, I think it was probably before Gersman went. But this, the big three there are still very much a big three with huge advantages over the rest. Right. And what I've what I've noticed a lot is the fact that there the academy is not as stressed as it maybe once was. Maybe this is me looking back through history and saying there was a golden generation where people produced more players from academies, but uh, it seems to me that a lot of clubs just focus on buying and selling players and not really developing their own talent. Is that a fair analysis or yeah, absolutely. And it's it's really depressing, I think, um, that um, clubs just want the big celebrities. Big clubs want to sign the, the, the big-name players. Um, I mean, uh, it's a short-term solutions, and I guess it makes chief executives feel big. <laughs> yeah, I'm the guy who went out and I spent 2 million euros on this great star. Uh I mean, I don't understand how that's financially viable. Um, you know, you, you, the phrase you hear is, oh, they'll pay for themselves in shirt sales, but it clearly doesn't work. You know, the most basic math tells you it doesn't work. Uh, you know, I, if looking as a, from a football point of view, Juventus signing Ronaldo is one of the worst deals in the history of football. That he took a team that won the league every year and made them a team that lost the league. He took them no nearer, in fact, took them further away winning the Champions League. And okay, he's got 81 goals in three years, but he made them worse and he stopped the development of the squad and the resources that went to paying him, you know, both his fee and his, his wages could have been better spent on, on, on other players. And you know, they, they clearly were having to restrict their spending elsewhere. Um, but people at Juventus say, oh, no, no, in terms of developing the brand and, and sort of raising global awareness of the club, you know, he, he, he more than paid for himself. I mean, I... I Maybe that's true. I don't, I don't understand that, that, how that works. But from a, from a football point of view, it was, it was a disastrous signing. Do you think the same could be said about Manchester United signing him? Or is that yeah. different? No, it's, it's exactly the same. I think it's um, some mission from United. They don't think they'll win the league this year. So they're giving fans a, a sop. You know, they're turning Old Trafford into sort of a, you know, a nostalgic theme park for the United of old. The, 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 I don't think the manager's good enough, but Solskjaer is uh, yeah, hugely popular because of what he did in 99. Ronaldo probably will score goals, maybe 20 goals this season. He will score against, I'm sure he'll score against Newcastle on his debut. Um, and he'll score against Norwich and Watford and Brighton, Crystal Palace. Will he make them more likely to win the biggest games? No, because he doesn't do any defensive work. If you look at his, his pressures per game, he's in the lowest percentile of forwards in the top five leagues in in Europe last season. Uh, you can't win. Oh, it's very, very hard to win the Champions League if you have a you know, basically 10 men working and one man scoring some goals. And that, you know, Barcelona have had the problem with Messi in recent years. His, as he's got older, his work rate is, is deteriorated. So, I mean, I, I think PSG are probably, it's probably, they've probably made it harder for themselves to win the Champions League this year by, by signing Messi. Hmm. Hmm. Um, you just mentioned that uh, Ole, you, do you think he's a subpar manager? Is that is that what you said? Yeah, well, he's 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 obviously not an idiot. No. Um, he's 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 a he's a decent manager. He's okay, but is he at the level of of Tuchel or like Guardiola or Klopp? No, he's nowhere near. Well, what makes what makes in your eyes a great manager? Well, I, I think in the modern game, there's two things that set apart the very best from, from the rest. 
And, and in a sense, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. So the one is organizing the press, and the other is, is organizing um, attacking moves. And I think where you see Manchester United fall down again and again and again, they have a very good play on the break, and they have great pace going forward, and Solskjaer can organize a defense. But what he, what he hasn't yet shown himself capable of doing is organizing an attack. So VAR, the New Europa League final last year, VAR, very well set up team, very well organized. And United had no idea how to break them down. They didn't have the, 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 the sort of, I don't want to call them preset moves because that, that, that makes it sound too mechanical. But they didn't have the, the, the organizational structure, the, the internal coherence to know where each other were going to be to pass the ball quick, quickly enough to, to break that down. Mm. And that's what really sets apart a Tuchel side or a Guardiola side or a Klopp side. They spend an inordinate amount of time on that. And it's tactically incredibly sophisticated and incredibly thorough. Um, and in, in the modern game, increasingly, and it's because of the, partly because of the financial disparities, increasingly big teams come up against smaller teams who sit very deep against them and make it difficult for them. And United quite often do break them down because they have some really good players. And it only needs one one great player to do something brilliant or you know, a lucky bounce of the ball or a defender switching off for a moment and they score once they're ahead, fine, they're going to win the game. But you saw last season the game away at West Brom, the game home in Sheffield United. Um, yeah, I'm sure there are other examples. I mean, they, they, they really struggled all the time that Nuno was at Wolves to break, break Wolves down. I think, I think nine games in Solskjaer and, and Wolves under, uh, under Nuno, I think United only won three, which given the the greater resources, given the better players they have, is, you know, is, is too low. You, you're not going to win a league if you're only beating Wolves three times out of nine. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, how about, where do you where do you put, would you put Jose in the upper echelon of managers? No, no not anymore. I mean, he was, but no, he's, um, for, for, for a decade, he hasn't been quite in the upper echelon. Hmm. Um, I think basically since he left, after leaving Inter, um, Real Madrid was a, it's difficult to read because there was so much else going on there. And you know, his job was to, to take down Guardiola and he, he did that. But I think it's significant cost. Um, and yeah, he, he now plays, he quite, quite willfully plays an, an outmoded form of football. And it, you know, he, he now seems to have this obsession with, I'm not just going to win, I'm going to win my way. I'm going to prove myself right. And so you saw his, it was last season at Tottenham how often they go 1-0 up and then they sit back and try and defend it and not be able to defend it. Even against, I mean, did it against Wolves um, when Wolves were in a really bad, bad patch. Uh, so, no, I, I think I think, I think Real Madrid, the, the toxicity of the end of that really wore him out. And he, he's now, again, yeah, he, he's, he's fine for, for a sort of mid-table club. Yeah, it's fine, but for a, for a really top club who wants to win the Champions League, no. What do you what do you see his uh, how he's going to handle Roma at the moment? Because I, I've seen a few matches and, and they, they they seem they seem pretty good. Yeah, it started well. It has started well. Um, I mean, we'll. we'll I, th- we'll, I think we'll it's a perfect. In... I think it's a perfect fit for him. Uh, but, Italian yeah. football is perfect for him. It seems like um, to me, at least. Yeah, possibly. I, I don't know. I mean, I think Italian football has changed quite a lot in the last sort of three or four years. I think pressing is much more accepted there. I think you've seen success of Atalanta uh, has persuaded people that the pressing actually is the future, which it, Italy was very, um, even after Saki, Saki was an outlier. They very reluctant to accept that. Uh, it's the right size of club for him. Um, yeah, because his whole thing is being the, being the rebel. They're all, they're all out to get us. The establishment hate us. And you can, you can do that at Porto. You could do it at Chelsea when he was in charge because they hadn't won anything for 50 years. You can't really do that when you're Manchester United or when you're Real Madrid, when you're the biggest club in, in, in England and Spain. Um, and also, I think fans of, of those outside of Rebel clubs accept a, a different type of football to what Manchester United or Real Madrid expect. Mm-hmm. Um, but the problem always is, if you play that type of football and are not successful, it goes sour very quickly because you're not giving people anything else. Players don't enjoy playing that type of football and fans don't enjoy watching that type of football. 
So as soon as results go bad, you know, nobody's sort of going, oh, you know, give him another few weeks because, yeah, this is great to watch. And, you know, every, this is just rubbish. So yeah, we'll see how it goes. I, I'd like to see him back because he's such a great sort of, I've got a great character, sort of seems a bit patronising, but football is better with, with big name, uh, charismatic coaches. And that, that brief spell in his final season at Tottenham when they just started very well, uh, you know, that was great fun. You got, we got the old Jose back, you know, being funny in press conferences and, and you sort of remembered, oh, yeah, this is the charm he used to have, uh, which really you didn't see at Manchester United and you didn't see it at Real Madrid. Uh, so it would be nice. But, I, I you know, the, 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 the fact is most managers have at most a decade at the very top of the game and his is probably over. And, and the, you know, there obviously are exceptions to that. But the problem is we think of Fergus Norvenga or Lobanovsk or Giru, but they're the exceptions. They, you know, most managers, 10 years, maybe 12, maybe eight, and then football moves on. It's a, it's a very difficult thing to do. It's football is constantly evolving. So for a manager to take a model that is successful and say, no, I will change this because I think it, we have to change to keep up with, with, with developments in, in wider football, to break up something that is already a success is an incredibly difficult thing to do. And just to keep on top of that constant evolution, to, to, to constantly challenge yourself, to constantly doubt what you're doing and to see if there's a way of doing it better. And Ferguson did it, but Ferguson was a monster. I mean, Ferguson was, you know, to players, to journalists, he was incredibly difficult to deal with. Um, he was incredibly driven. And I, I'm not really sure modern players could handle that in the way that Manchester United's players in the, in the 90s did. Um, and we saw with Beckham, we saw with Ronaldo to an extent, there were flashpoints in this final decade or so in charge. And I suspect with modern players who have different expectations of how they, and, and quite, you know, totally reasonable expectations. I mean, nobody should go into work and be screamed at constantly. Um, I, I'm not sure they'd, they'd react well to, to that kind of approach. Mm. Yeah, but there's also a lack of, at times, loyalty to managers that actually accomplish something in their careers and then rewarding managers that have not really accomplished anything. It, Manchester United is a perfect example, right? Ole, uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has not accomplished much in his three years, yet is given this, you know, people, uh, the club still spends a lot. Uh, he gets new players. He gets to keep working. While a guy like David Moyes, who uh, I don't think did a, a worse job personally than Ole, and I think is a, gr- a good manager, maybe not at the Manchester United level, but a, a good manager, gets fired after a year. Mm-hmm. You know, or there's two, there's, two, there's two things going on there though. So the first is, um, yeah, Moyes is not United legend, and Solskjaer is. So obviously, fans are going to be sure. much more sympathetic to Solskjaer. And the second is Moyes takes over from Ferguson. Yeah, he, he took over a team that was league champions. So the expectation of United fans is, well, we'll keep on being champions or at least being very close. And they finished, what, seventh in Moyes' season? I think sixth. Or, sixth, yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, nowhere near winning the title. Um, so uh, that, you know, United fans now, they, you know, they haven't won the league for... Uh, what, uh, it would be nine years if they don't win it this season. Um, so expectations have changed. If there's now a recognition, yeah, maybe we do need to be more patient. We do need to build something. Um, so those two things together, the, the instinctive sympathy for Solskjaer on, from the fan base and the... Uh, and, you know, he's useful for the board because he, he deflects criticism. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody loves Solskjaer. And so the criticism is reined back. Um, and maybe that actually makes fans more realistic because they, they clearly did need to be a lot of rebuilding done. I think the squad Ferguson left. Yeah, I, I think for Ferguson to win the league in 2013 was an incredible achievement because it, the squad was, just wasn't very good. And it did need a lot of surgery. And I think it's taken United a long time to work out exactly what they need to do. I think they've wasted a huge amount of money. I think there's been very little coherent thought there. And finally now, at least till they signed Ronaldo, 
they had a squad that you thought, yeah, that's that's not far off being a title winning squad. It's probably not as good as Chelsea's squad. It's probably not as good as City's squad. But at least it's a squad that should be within 10 points. And maybe if they hit a patch of form at the right period of the season, if things go well, maybe they actually could win the league. But at least they can make a challenge. Uh, and if they don't, and you know, as Ronaldo complicates everything, of course. Um, but if they don't, then I, you know, I, th- I think they, they have to sort of accept Solskjaer is not, is not up to it. You know, there's no excuses anymore. Yeah, uh, so that kind of leads perfectly to one of my next questions, which is who do you think is going to win the Premier League and who do you think had the best summer uh, in terms of the transfer window? Uh, I, well, I think it'd be very tight between City and Chelsea. Um, I think City have marginally the better squad with the obvious exception they don't have a centre-forward. Um, Tuchel has beaten Guardiola the last three times they've met. And Tuchel, I think, you know, that, that, that game at Liverpool, the, the way Chelsea managed the second half with 10 men, I thought was incredibly impressive. Um, so I, you know, I think at the moment, uh, we've had a, had a long spell where between the elite clubs, the tax were on top. And that's totally understandable because if you're PSG, you, know, you don't need to defend in, in Liga. You, the only question is, do we win 3-0 or 7-0 today? You know, it's uh, every defender they buy, they buy, can he pass? Can he make breaks forward? Can fullbacks make breaks forward and put crosses in? The same to a slightly lesser extent in Spain, the same in Italy, or it should have been before you didn't win the league last year, buying exactly the same. And the problem then is when those big teams meet each other, they're, they're totally out of practice at how to defend. And they don't have the tactical wherewithal and they don't have the mental wherewithal to, to resist. And so you, that's why you get big scores in Champions League knockout games, which is great to watch. It's, you know, it's great drama, not just necessarily great football. Um, and it's why you, we've started seeing these huge swings in, in European ties that, you know, 15 years ago, a 3-0 lead was pretty much insurmountable. And now you sort of think, well, there are a lot of examples of three-goal leads, even a four-goal lead in, in one case, being being overturned. So you know, I think we've been at a stage for two or three years where people have realised, and you know, I remember Jürgen Klopp talking about this, um, and Tuchel certainly is, is actively doing it. I think the way City played last season, uh, often playing with a double pivot, trying to keep five men behind the ball at all times, um, that they've realised if we can slightly temper the attacking, if we can become a team who, who is both good at pressing but also can retain possession, can defend in a more orthodox way, that gives us a huge advantage over the rest. And Tuchel, what we saw the, the last stage of the Champions League last season, what we saw in that, um, that Liverpool game, Chelsea defensively the best of the super clubs, and I think that gives them a massive advantage. How about Liverpool? Well, Liverpool, the big question is, uh, was last season a freak because of the injuries or had that team reached its peak and started to, to drift? And I think certainly there's evidence that front three is not quite what it was two or three years ago, which is understandable. They're all 29 now. Um, and OK, 29 is not old, but there's a slight sense of sameness and staleness. So Jota coming in is, you know, is um, I think, vital for them. And he has started the season very well. But I, I think Liverpool's squad just isn't isn't quite. Yeah, if if they're lucky with injuries, absolutely they can they can compete. And you know, I mean, obviously they can. They won the league two years ago. Um, but I'd I'd worry about that squad. That a couple of injuries, and it suddenly looks pretty bare. Uh, and it is an aging squad. I, I think I think I'm right in saying last season, it in, in you know if you worked out per minute play, they had the older squad in the Premier League, um, and they haven't really made it any younger. You know, it's not like they've made a load of young signings. So they've got a couple of, of kids coming through. But I, 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 I still think... I, mean, I really hope Liverpool can challenge. Uh, just because you know, a four-way race is better than a three-way race. And I suspect United won't be in the race anyway. Um, but I, I, I suspect that the, the squad isn't, doesn't quite have the depth to, to sustain the challenge. Um, and so before I get to my last question, I want to ask you, uh, I don't know if this is a fair question. You don't have to answer it. Uh, Messi or Ronaldo? If you have uh, a favorite. Uh, I mean, in terms of sustained success, in terms of changing how football is played, it's it's really obviously Messi. Um, you know, Ronaldo's record 
he won what two league titles in Spain in nine seasons. That's really not that good. Um, obviously, you know, great success in the Champions League. Um, but I, I think that lack of sustained success in the league really ought to count against him a bit more than it does. It's obviously not, not his fault or not entirely his fault. You know, there's other people to blame there. But no, I think Messi, how can I put this? Ronaldo did things incredibly well that I'd seen before. Messi did things I'd never really seen before. And he also made that team play, particularly the, the Guardiola side from 2008 to 2011. He made that team play in a way that you know, has never been done before and has, hasn't been done since. So, yeah, it's, it'd, be, it'd be messy for me. Do you have a favourite player of all time or do you think it's not fair to compare players of different generations? I, I mean, it's, yeah, it's always a, it's a slightly artificial comparison because there's so many... Uh, I mean, whenever I'm asked this, just to be annoying, I always say Huey Wilson who was a centre-half for Sunderland in the 1890s, who was a very good passer of the ball, was legendarily hard. Uh, Sunderland won three league titles, and they won the first Club World Cup in 1895. They played the Scottish Champions Hearts in Edinburgh and beat them 5-3. So, it's, yeah, a favourite player of all time, uh, Huey Wilson. Got it. Uh, and last question, what are five books uh, that you would recommend to anyone, fiction, non-fiction? Ooh. Um, hmm. I mean, I asked, obviously, I asked, obviously, my own. Oh, of course. Uh, I, I'm gonna. Sorry for before you answer your question. Uh, all your books or most of them will be linked on the bottom of my description for the video version and the audio version of the podcast. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, well, I think. Dublin has made me think about writing in a way that I hadn't previously thought about it. And to an extent, that's coincidence. I read it when I was 17 and I was very much ripe to be informed. Um, but yeah, I, I still love Joyce, uh, love Ulysses as well, but Dublin is obviously a lot more accessible. And I still go back to Dublin as a lot. Um, so let's say Dubliners. Uh, I really like Utz. Uh, it's Bruce Chatwin's last novel, um, which I think packs an incredible amount into a very, very, yeah, very slim book, very slim novel. Uh, I mean, ostensibly, it's about a porcelain collector in Prague who uh, has a very ambiguous relationship with his collection in the uh, latter days of, of the communist regime in Prague. But it's actually about way more than that. And there's also some incredibly funny passages that I don't think Chatwin really gets credit for. Uh, so those two. Um, I sort of feel like I should. I mean, I'm sort of slightly saying this because he's a mate of mine. Um, I play cricket with him, but uh, I think Dominion by Tom Holland made me think about things uh, in a way I hadn't before. Which is, I don't want to call it a history of Christianity because it's not really that. It's um, it's more an exploration of how Christianity continues to colour thought, even as Christian thought and, and secularism, um, as Christian thought wanes and secularism rises in, in Western Europe. Um, I think uh, Victory by Joseph Conrad, uh, which I think is a book not, you know, obviously a lot of people read Conrad, I don't think a lot of people read Victory. Um, I, I, I think in, it's simultaneously for me both his most readable book and I think the one that's, that's most interesting in, in terms of very subtly playing with themes of, of empire and uh, responsibilities that the that, that, that people within that framework have um, uh, what else Well, I, I really love detective fiction and thrillers. And so I will say, tempted to say an Agatha Christie. I think And Then There Were None is, is one of the, the most perfectly plotted books there's ever been. Uh, so it's either that or Le Carre. Um, 
But the carry on suffers because there's too many that are too good. So yeah, I'll, I'll say I'll say and then there were none by Agatha Christie. Wonderful. Uh, so obviously, as I mentioned before, all your books will be linked on the bottom of my description uh, for the podcast, the audio, and the YouTube version. Jonathan Wilson, thank you for coming on to the podcast. Cheers. Thank you.